Good, 89. Yes, we're all on mute. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome you all to the fourth uh, Aura webinar. And uh, today we have got uh, a power pack uh, presentation by uh, two great uh, eminent faculties. Uh, Dr. Amjad, who will be speaking on QL block, and uh, Dr. Sandeep Divan uh, on the ESP block. So uh, uh, just uh, uh, not to waste time, uh, we will just uh, uh, go to the presentation. Hand over to you. I hand over the baton to Dr. Vandana Mangal uh, to carry on the session from. Adam, over to you. Vanda, madam, over to you. Hello. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Am okay. I audible? Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Ritesh. It's my pleasure to introduce this evening to all of you, all of you to Dr. Amjad Mani Maniar, who is a young and dynamic kinesiologist. Uh, he's done most of his career as graduation, post-graduation at MS Ramayya Medical College, Bangalore, and then a fellowship in regional anesthesia at Singapore. He has uh, worked at many hospitals and um, he has he's been a faculty in various academic activities related to regional anesthesia, more than 50. It'll take very long if I enumerate all of them, but they have been at all levels, national and international. He's also organized many of them. I'm sure you can see me turning pages. Uh, this is all the CV of Dr. Amjad Maniya. He has publications to his credit and he's a very active member of AORA. Besides these achievements, he has to his credit, uh, he has in this COVID era, devised or rather modified the aerosol box in such a way that it becomes more comfortable ergonomically for an anesthesiologist to work, which many of us have used and found it very useful. It is so ergonomically useful that he even performed a USG guided supraclavicular block using the aerosol box and published a case report. Dr. Maniar will today speak on the quadratus lumbar block and over to you, Amjad. Yes, over to you, Amjad. Thank you, Dr. Vandana, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Let me just get my... So, a very good evening to everybody watching this webinar. Uh, I'm actually a little jealous of uh, Dr. Sandeep Devan because he got the nice topic saying mysterious and uh, curious and those sort of colorful words. But most of us who have been through the, the era of facial plane blocks know that all the problems in regional anesthesia these days started with the quadratus lumborum block. Before these facial plane blocks came in, everything was... Uh, very rosy. We had upper limb blocks, we had lower limb blocks, we knew how it worked. And then came along these bunch of, uh, you know, facial plane blocks that changed the landscape completely. And I hope you can bear with me while I go through some concepts of this quadratus lumborum block today. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, I have saved this picture for many years now. This lady uh, was an elderly woman who underwent uh, a, a laparotomy for a sort of cancer surgery. She had multiple issues in her abdomen and uh, multiple comorbids too. And for uh, some spine issues, spine related issues that she was on anticoagulation, we couldn't put an epidural for her. And she was very demanding of, of high quality analgesia. So we, this was probably the first bilateral quadratus lumborum catheter that I had placed many years ago. And the results were quite dramatic. Uh, 
the patient was, this was the immediate uh, picture in the recovery room. The patient was sitting up. She had very minimal opiates for a seven hour surgery and she was sitting up completely pain-free. And this was very characteristic over the years of what we saw when we did these sort of fancy plane blocks, the extremely dramatic level of analgesia that it produced. We were used to doing upper limb blocks and lower limb blocks, and it was a very predictable picture. The wear off patterns would be similar. The patients would, you know, when the block wears off, the patients would be in intense pain. But with these facial plane blocks, especially the quadratus lumborum block, the quality of analgesia was phenomenal. And this was an absolute game changer for all of us. So what is it? It's an abdominal wall block, but we give it not in the anterior abdomen, not in the midline, mid axillary line. We give it in the posterior abdomen. And it's named after its relation with a quadrilateral shaped muscle called the quadratus lumborum. It is a facial plane block, we all know that. It provides analgesia mostly for abdominal surgeries, though it has been noted to be used for hip surgeries also. Some reports suggest that it provides visceral analgesia. Mainly this, this was kind of an unproven concept, but when you have a patient who has undergone a major abdominal surgery and sitting with zero pain scores in the post-op, you can be pretty sure that your local anesthetic has taken care of everything. And this was the, the great drama that it, it provided. It could provide analgesia, allegedly, from as high as the level as T4 to as low as L2, though inconsistently. But this was the capability that we could expect from the block. When we look at abdomen analgesia, I like to divide the abdomen into an upper and a lower abdomen part. The dividing line would be somewhere below, just below the umbilicus. And you have a variety of blocks that are available these days, which you can perform for analgesia of these areas. The QLB was quite interesting because just like the erector spinae these days, the QLB could span across both areas, the upper abdomen and the lower abdomen and provide surgeries where the incision span both these areas. So just looking at where we are in the body when we are trying to uh, address the quadratus lumborum block, we are mostly towards the posterior lateral side. And if you look underneath, the superficial muscles of the anterior abdominal wall end somewhere around the mid axillary line and just slightly posterior to that. And the only superficial muscles that you will see in the back are the latissimus dorsi and the serratus posterior. So when you look underneath these muscles, you see three large muscles, uh, the erector spinae group, the quadratus lumborum, and the psoas major muscle. There's nothing really special about this muscle that has made it uh, you know, such a popular uh, aspect of regional anesthesia. It originates from the iliac crest, and it gets inserted into the inferior border of the 12th rib as well as the transverse processes of the L1 to L4 vertebra. Its function, just like most of the muscles that control the spine is stabilization and movement of the spine, as well as the pelvis. So when you, when you look at these sort of blocks, whether it is uh, you know, peripheral nerve blocks in the upper limb or lower limb, it's always good to have a three-dimensional anatomy uh, picture inside your head. So this is how the cross section of the abdomen would look somewhere in the lower abdomen area. On the superficial side, you can see the external oblique, the internal oblique, the transversus abdominis. This is where you would normally give a tap block. But as you move more and more lateral, you see the termination of the transversus abdominis muscle. And this is where the quadratus lumborum muscle is. And you can see that they are arranged pretty much in this pattern. And many of you have seen the shamrock uh, leaf pattern. Uh, this is the arrangement of the muscles of the posterior abdomen. If you look at the sono anatomy, and if you're trying to find where exactly you are in the scheme of things, uh, right around in the center would be where the rectus would be. And these are where the the abdominal wall muscles are. 
So as these muscles terminate, when we go somewhere near the posterior, this is where you see the quadratus lumborum muscle, and that is our site for activity. Getting closer into what the ultrasound picture is, if you can get an image like this when you're trying to do the block, you're pretty much set. You see that the, the external oblique terminates somewhere around here, the internal oblique terminates. By the time you reach the quadratus lumborum muscle, the transversus abdominis muscle has completely terminated. So what you see here is pretty much either the perinephric fat or the abdomen. The psoas major would come somewhere around here. And this is where the transversalis fascia along with the peritoneum would come in. Uh, it's very important to know where these structures are and how to identify them when you are trying to attempt this block. When you try to do a different approach to the quadratus lumborum block, the QL3 or the transmuscular, sometimes you require to use uh, a, a, either a curvilinear probe or a much deeper approach. Some people like to get the shamrock sign view in, uh, in the picture when they do this block. So this is where the tra transverse process is. The psoas major, the quadratus lumborum muscle, and the erector spinae. And this together appear like the leaf of the shamrock. And uh, this is just a pattern for you to easily identify and uh, attempt this block. Now, apart from the musculature and uh, everything else that resides in this area, an important anatomical entity is the thoracolumbar fascia. Now, the thoracolumbar fascia has three layers the anterior layer, the middle layer, and the posterior layer. The thoracolumbar fascia is the deep fascia of the muscles of the back. So it encloses all these three muscles. So the anterior layer is usually formed as, it's a very thin layer, and this is very different from the sheath that encloses the psoas muscle. So it's a completely different entity, and it's uh, more or less a continuation of the transversalis fascia and is seen mostly on the anterior surface of the quadratus lumborum muscle. The middle layer is usually seen on the posterior surface of the quadratus lumborum muscle, and the posterior layer is the thickest layer of the thoracolumbar fascia, and is seen to enclose the erector spinae muscle. When we think of fascia, you immediately think of something, you know, very dry, thin, fibrous, uh, a very boring sort of structure when, it, when we talk about anatomy, but the thoracolumbar fascia is not that. So it is a very unique fascia, which is covered with mechanoreceptors. And there is apparently a high amount of sympathetic fibers, neural lining on this fascia. So any blockade of the thoracolumbar fascia can lower sympathetic nervous system activity and may cause increases and decreases in arterial blood pressure. So the thoracolumbar fascia is interesting for this manner. It is also one of the fascias that we'll have to go through when we try to deposit the local anesthetic. So the quadratus lumborum block is uh, almost entirely attributed to the work of Dr. Rafael Blanco, who described it at the ESRA Congress in 2007. And over the years, there has been a continuous evolution in the technique. There have been different approaches and methodologies proposed for this block. And for all of us, we know that this is purely an ultrasound guided technique. So when I said that there, there's been an evolution of the, these blocks, the initial description that came from Dr. Blanco was an entity known as the quadratus lumborum one block. And the area that you see here is the place where he proposed that we should put the local anesthetic. There is a name for this area. It's known as the lateral raffae. And uh, your needle would probably come in this way and you would try to deposit the anesthetic in this area. So this was the quadratus lumborum block, which was named QL1. Subsequently, he described uh, the QL2 approach. So the QL2 moved further posterior and into this plane that you see here. 
Now this plane is interesting and uh, I'll tell you about this plane a little later. Uh, this plane contains an important entity that is the abdominal branch of the lumbar artery. And uh, many years ago when I spoke to Dr. Blanco, he felt that there were two things that happened when you uh, injected the local anesthetic into this plane. One is that it would travel between the different layers of the thoracolumbar fascia into the paravertebral spaces higher above. The next is he felt that this was the actual neurovascular plane uh, which carried the local anesthetic into the lumbar sympathetic chain. So this was the mystery of the QL2 and a lot of us started doing this. Almost, a, you know, probably a year later, the QL3, sorry about that description, this is the QL3 or the transmuscular block came out from uh, uh, an author named Jens Borglum from Denmark where he proposed that the local anesthetic can be placed between the quadratus lumborum muscle and the psoas major muscle below. And he felt that this was a more uh, appropriate area to place the local anesthetic. So he called this the transmuscular approach. Many of us call this the QL3 for uh, various reasons. There's also different terminology that is commonly used with the uh, block. The QL1 is sometimes called the lateral QLB because of its anatomical position. The QL2 is sometimes called the posterior QLB and the transmuscular is often sometimes called the uh, anterior QLB. There was a fourth, uh, there was a fourth variant called the intramuscular QLB, which involved deposition. This came from a Japanese author called Morochi, uh, where he, he actually said that you could put the local anesthetic directly inside the quadratus lumborum muscle, and this would provide analgesia. I'm not sure how that happens, but probably by as we progress in this talk, we'll get to the bottom of this. Uh, can I request the person who put those uh, inks to get rid of it, please. Yeah. So before the QLB got its due recognition, there was another block that uh, came out. Uh, many of you have heard about this and I keep getting asked about this in relation to the quadratus lumborum block, the fascia transversalis plane block. Uh, many of you might have heard about this. This came about in 2008 to 2009. And this was purely for analgesia of the iliac crest. So uh, what they proposed was that the L1 nerve, the cutaneous branches that supply the iliac crest often branch early and giving a tap block for analgesia was not good enough. So they proposed putting the local anesthetic at the level of the fascia transversalis and this would provide more wholesome analgesia of the iliac crest. So this is the area where they propose that you would put the local anesthetic for a fascia transversalis block. And if you look very closely, it's not too far from where the QL1 would be. It's not very far from where QL2 would be. And really when you're talking about volumes like 20 mils of local anesthetic, it's not very far from anything. And if you look at the image from the article, the dark area is where they propose it would be. So. The fascia transversalis block is just another representation of the same concept of the quadratus lumborum block. But if we turn back the clock a lot more to 2001, and if you remember that uh, a doctor from Ireland named Dr. Rafi described the TAP block, uh, many people, when we think of the TAP block, we think of those three muscles of the abdomen and you go pop, pop, and deposit the local anesthetic. But the original tap lock was actually a single pop technique done in the posterior abdomen in the petite triangle. And the petite triangle is an anatomical place where it is bordered by the latissimus dorsi, the external oblique, and the base of the triangle is the iliac crest. Now, if we interpret this petite triangle into uh, an, an ultrasound image, this is how it's going to be. This is a familiar picture. I've been putting this all through the talk. The quadratus lumborum is right there on the left. And 
this is where the petite triangle would be. This is very interesting, isn't it? So what Dr. Rafi did was he would feel the posterior abdomen very carefully with his fingers and try to hook on to the latissimus dorsi. He would feel for the lateral border of the latissimus dorsi and put the needle in at the lateral border until he felt a single pop. And if we interpret that, look where the local anesthetic is going. So for all practical purposes, the landmark technique of tap block was actually the quadratus lumborum block as we know it today. And this was actually proved in this very interesting article that was uh, available in 2011 uh, on the spread of local anesthetic during tap blocks. And one of the groups underwent landmark blocks of the landmark tap blocks and they evaluated them under MRI. And interestingly, they found that the local anesthetic was seen at the lateral border of the quadratus lumborum muscle in all the subjects that they uh, tried this block on. And it behaved exactly like how we know the quadratus lumborum block to behave. So the quadratus lumborum block is actually an interpretation of Rafi's landmark technique. So this is how the blocks are. This is the QL1. This is where the quadratus lumborum muscle is. And you see the fill. Probably this fill is a little more medial than it should be that you see over here. Uh, but that's pretty much how a QL1 block would be. The QL2 block is very different. This is the quadratus lumborum muscle here. You can see the hyperechoic fascia and the needle depositing the local anesthetic very gently in this plane. That's the QL2. Ritesh was kind enough to lend me his transmuscular QL video for this talk. So this is with a low frequency probe. This is the rectus spinae muscle. And this is the psoas muscle that you see here. This little structure, because it's a high frequency probe, is the quadratus lumborum muscle. So the transmuscular QL is an injection between the QL muscle as well as the psoas muscle. So this is the general area where you would expect the local anesthetic to be. If you look at intramuscular QLs, again, uh, every now and then you might find when you're trying to do either a transmuscular or a QL2 block, you might find the local anesthetic sitting inside the muscle. So this may be an intramuscular QL because of the clear definition of the thoracolumbar fascia all along. So the psoas muscle is somewhere down there. And you can see very clearly that the local is filling up in here. This is actually a catheter that has been placed inadvertently inside the muscle. So when we're looking for the fill, that's the kind of fill we got. So this is very typical of an intramuscular QL. So the question is, and this is, this is not just for the QL block, it's in general, how do facial plane blocks work? One is we know all blocks provide some sort of phenomenon when the local anesthetic comes in direct contact on the nerves. If there's a nerve in the area, you get a block. So that's one way if it works. When you look at the intercostal nerve blocks, because that area has very, it's a richly vascular area, as well as the muscle structures are extremely thin. There is diffusion of local anesthetic through thin planes, which can come in contact with the nerves which is why that many of you who do tap blocks will see that many of the times, in fact, most of the time, you are probably not between the ideal facial layers and a bit of your local anesthetic has gone intramuscular, but your block does work. Sometimes it takes a while to kick in, but it does work. So the diffusion of the local anesthetic may be another phenomenon that makes facial plane blocks work. Of course, this is the most mysterious part of facial plane blocks, the travel of the local anesthetic towards some significant neural structure. Most of the time when you want that, that really good high quality low, uh, anesthetic or analgesic effect, it is a spread towards the neural axis. And there's a fourth phenomenon that we'll touch upon today, the intravascular action that may be happening. So if we talk about the QLB and we are looking at neural structures in the vicinity that may be directly affected. It is the L1 nerve as well as the T12 or the subcostal nerve. Both these entities lie in the area between the 
so is muzzle and the quadratus lumborum muzzle. And uh, this is how an image of it would look. This is, uh, this is actually a nephrectomy. This is the psoas muzzle that you see there. This is the QL muzzle. And if you look very closely, you can see a nerve. Probably this is the T12 nerve running across the quadratus lumborum muzzle. And this is where it actually lies. When you uh, look at the quadratus lumborum muzzle, this is the area where these two nerves actually come out and they head towards this plane, which is the transversus abdominis plane. So any local anesthetic in this area, this is the site of the QL1, this is the site of the QL2, this is the site of the QL3. So any local anesthetic deposition in this area will directly affect the L1 and the T12 nerve. So this is great for surgery such as the uh, cesarean sections, inguinal hernias, uh, fan and steel incisions, it's, it's an absolutely great area to block, which is why many of the articles, especially this first one that came out from Dr. Blanco, talk about providing great analgesia below the umbilicus, that is the lower abdomen. So this was the initial trial that he had done for analgesia after cesarean uh, sections. And um, basically he found that the tap blocks tends to act faster, but the blocks like the uh, QL block tends to have a much longer effect. Oops, Just one moment. Yeah, so this is another block uh, another QL block done for lower abdominal surgery. Again, very good quality of analgesia provided, uh, much better than the tap. So you can, if you actually look through PubMed, you'll find that most of the articles, most of the studies that happen actually uh, look at providing analgesia below the umbilicus. So that is one way you can provide very reliable analgesia using the QL block. So the other concept that we are fascinated about is the cranial spread. That is the local anesthetic delivered somewhere around the flank tends to travel upwards towards the, um, towards the paravertebral space. You just give me a moment. I will just try to clear my slide up. So these were initial images again from Dr. Blanco and showing the spread after a QL2 block. And uh, you can see the dye spread towards the second, uh, the 12th and the 11th rib, as well as medial towards the neuraxis. So the other entity that, uh, just one moment, please. I'm just having a little bit of trouble with my slide here. Yeah, the other entity that we encounter when we approach the QL2 is the lumbar interfacial triangle. So this area is somewhere between the erector spinae muscle and the quadratus lumborum muscle. Uh, it's also known as the lift. So it is just a formation, a kind of triangle formed by the uh, thoracolumbar fascia. And because this is a known entity, uh, we can easily target this and access the plane required to enter the QL2 block. The lift is formed by the posterior and the middle thoracolumbar fascia, as well as the posterior aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis muscle. And Theoretically, it's divided into two compartments and the outer compartment is the site where we are supposed to be injecting. Uh, but this is again something very theoretical. We don't really see these sort of uh, layers when we do the ultrasound guided block. But a rough area, it, you will find the, the, uh, the zone to inject somewhere. You can see the needle over here and the injection happening. 
I'll just get my pointer back on. Yeah. So somewhere in this area is where you would find the lumbar interfacial triangle. So this is a cross section of where the lift would be. This is the lift. This is the QL muzzle over here. This is the rectus spinae. And this is where you would want to inject. So in, in terms of the ultrasonic image that you would want to approach, this is where the transversus abdominis ends. And this is the kind of zone where you would look for the lift. The lift also contains the abdominal branch of the lumbar artery. And uh, that is one identifying factor that you must keep in mind because uh, any trauma to this artery could lead to massive hematomas. You must also look at the lift as a three-dimensional structure. So the, the thoracolumbar fascia and the lift ascends upwards and is part of the insertion of uh, the muscles into the transverse processes of the uh, lumbar, upper lumbar vertebrae. So if you look at this image that was taken from Dr. Blanco's uh, um, post, uh, you can see that the, there is a trickle of dye, probably where the lumbar sympathetic chain would be. So we had this discussion and he was very sure that nerves, as you know, the neurovascular pain, nerves as well as vessels travel together. So entering the plane of that abdominal branch would perhaps take the local anesthetic deeper inside into the sympathetic chain. So these are all concepts that were thought about. Again, there is no solid proof for a lot of what I'm saying today, but it's just something to keep in mind. When the transmuscular approach came along, uh, again, the, the, the interest was to see whether this once again spreads towards the thoracic paravertebral space. And the same authors conducted uh, a dye study on cadavers. And they found that 100% of the time, there was spread from the transmuscular area via the medial and lateral arcuate ligaments into the thoracic paravertebral area. Now the QL2 would create a spread via the thoracic uh, thoracolumbar fascia, which is connected to the endothoracic fascia when you go uh, cephalad. So with the, in the case of the transmuscular block, the spread was likely to happen through the, uh, the medial and uh, lateral arcuate ligaments. The, this was a, a study looking into the different cadaver studies on the spread of local anesthetic after quadratus lumborum blocks. This was by El Sharkavi, it was I think last year. So they looked at a few studies and only two studies, one done by Dam and the other done by the author himself, showed that the local anesthetic in cadavers can travel up to the paravertebral space. In, uh, in different other studies, the kind of spread achieved was very different. There would be lateral spread. Uh, one of the studies by Carlin, which I'll talk about, actually showed that the transmuscular quadratus lumborum block can create spread to the L1 and L3 nerve root, which is rather unique and their reasoning why it may be useful for hip surgeries. This was uh, that study I was talking about by Carleen. And uh, the QL1 and QL2 blo blocks did not have a very fascinating spread. They actually spread into the tap plane. Uh, but it was the transmuscular block that was very interesting. It went on to, to stain the L1 and L3 nerve roots along with the genitofemoral nerve, the femoral nerve, the obturator nerve, all these entities got stained. Uh, but if you look at the area of injection, the point of injection that they illustrated in this, uh, in this paper, it looked like their injection was very, very close to the transverse process very close to the neuraxis, which could be the reasoning. Technique plays a huge role in the effect uh, of the quadratus lumborum block, which is probably the reason why many people tend to have different results in terms of spread when they do this block. 
I was talking about intravascular absorption. This is something that people don't talk much about, but uh, we have to look into this when we talk about facial plane blocks. Now, there are two concepts to what we do, anesthesia and analgesia. And you ask yourself the question, what do facial plane, plane blocks provide? Do they give you anesthesia or do they give you analgesia? And most of the time, and you look back at your own practice, and you're going to find that when you do these blocks, you're doing it for analgesia. Anesthesia is very specific. It is, it is, uh, it's an, a very pure topic. The, the, if you are trying to provide good anesthesia, you should be able to create conditions that allow the patient to tolerate a surgical incision. So you either do a GA or you've seen complete blockade of the nerve when you do say a beautiful brachial plexus block. But analgesia is a very, very hazy term and it's time we actually look for you know, clear definitions of it. Analgesia is pretty much pain relief in our case after surgery. Anybody can do it. You don't need to be an anesthesiologist to give analgesia. You can give IV oral medications. People say you can do acupressure, acupuncture, hypnosis, funny things like that, which provide analgesia. And in the end, you might just have a patient who is really tough, really tough after surgery. He doesn't need much analgesia. So analgesia is a very vague term. We don't have clear definitions of it. And here we are with facial plane blocks providing analgesia. And this is why I uh, am harping on this topic a lot, because I looked up PubMed today, I saw 233 articles on the quadratus lumborum block, but only one case report where they used the quadratus lumborum block to provide anesthesia for a surgery. And they used it for a very predictable open inguinal hernia repair. I said earlier, L1 and T12 are right in that spot. So inguinal hernia is a great place to provide surgical anesthesia with the quadratus lumborum block, but there was just one article on it. There's the other concept of what happens when you give a local anesthetic, a, a, a nice strong dose of local anesthetic into a facial plane. So there are uh, there's a review article that looked at 15 studies that measured the plasma concentration of local anesthetics after tap and rectus sheath blocks. There's, there's only about one or two papers on the effects with uh, quadratus lumborum block, but for all practical purposes, we look at ropivacaine in a facial plane block and see what actually happens to absorption. Now they took 2.3 micrograms per ml as the toxic threshold for CNS uh, symptoms. And these were the various doses that they used, 200 milligrams, 50 milligrams. There were two studies which used levobupivacaine and lignocaine. So we'll just ignore that. That's the one lignocaine one that you see up there. But if you keep 2.3 as the cutoff, you'll find that in some cases, uh, the intravascular absorption of local anesthetic after a TAP block comes very close to systemic toxic levels, though none of these manifested as uh, uh, LA toxicity, the plasma levels seem to reach that high a level. And this level, uh, levels of local anesthetic absorption is dependent on many things, uh, mo mostly the patient condition lower systemic levels of protein actually lead to higher plasma levels, as well as states like trauma where there's been a lot of blood loss, pregnancy who are pregnant, you know, LSAS patients are our prime customers for TAP blocks, cardiac conditions, renal failure, hepatic, they're all, um, they're all factors that influence the LA absorption. Also, very interestingly is that if you get your local anesthetic to spread over a large area, like in a facial plane block, the greater systemic absorption occurs. So this is the reason why when we do facial blocks, that is whether it is a PEX block, it's a serratus block, TAP blocks, QL or erector spinae blocks, there is a fairly large amount of local anesthetic systemic absorption. And what happens when this goes intravascular? It's very interesting. Murli is here today. He's a chronic pain guy. 
So uh, he knows the, the, the chronic pain guys have been using lignocaine intravascularly for years. And it's only come recently come into acute pain. And in acute pain, when you use lignocaine, which is the only drug we have that we can give intravascularly, there is significant anti-hyperalgesic and anti-inflammatory properties. And mainly, it reduces sensitivity and activity of the spinal cord neurons, and a, a concept known as central sensitization. And it decreases NMDA receptor uh, depolarization. There's a decrease in systemic inflammatory markers in patients who receive intravenous lignocaine perioperatively. And this is, again, something very interesting. The clinical benefits usually exceed the half-life by about 5.5 times. So if you stop a local anesthetic uh, like lignocaine going intravenously, you might see the clinical benefits in some studies up to 24 hours. In some of the studies, it can go up to 72 hours. In fact, one of the studies that said that the peak effect of analgesia caused by IV lignocaine may be seen as late as 36 hours post-surgery. Last month in daring discourse of RAPM, there was a bit of a riffraff happening. And uh, this was a, a letter written by Dr. Longquist and Professor Karmakar regarding the erector spinae plane block and other facial blocks in general. And they shared the this, this same thinking that there is systemic plasma levels of local anesthetic when you use it in a facial plane block. And they propose that future studies looking at analgesia from facial plane blocks must take into consideration and measure the systemic local anesthetic levels because they also felt that this creates some amount of analgesia. Moving on to some frequently asked questions, this is not going to be much of a technical talk, it's more of a concept talk of the QL block, but many people like to know how much do you inject for a QL. Pretty much I would say every block these days we give 20 ml syringes and uh, the reason why we give 20 ml, where few studies say 20 ml is good, plus they, after 20 ml, they only make 50 ml syringes. So that's probably the reason I use 20 ml for all my blocks. But on average, pretty much you can give 15 to 20 ml in the QL area. But of course, you need to measure body weight and see that you don't exceed toxic doses. What position can you do the block in? Well, it depends how comfortable you are with the needle and syringe in your hand. Most people like to do it in the lateral position. You can do it in the supine position, as you can see over here. Uh, you just need to ensure that you get enough space uh, in the posterior flank so that you can wedge your probe in there and image the muzzle clearly. Apart from the usual bouquet of complications with regional anesthesia, the usual uh, complication that we can expect are injury to the abdominal viscera because the kidney and the bowels are very close. If you don't look out for that abdominal branch of the lumbar artery, you can hit it and create a lot of bleeding. And uh, though theoretically they say that you can block the roots if you go too much towards the neuraxis, uh, I haven't seen it uh, happen in uh, my years of using this blockade. Can you use it elsewhere, just like they use the quadratus lumborum block pretty much everywhere in the body? Yes, it has been used for hip analgesia, but again, this is subjective to your usage and whether you want to really put this for a hip surgery. Of all the approaches we have, which is the best approach? Uh, well, uh, it's I leave it up to you to decide uh, because pretty much, when you put 20 mils of local anesthetic around a small area like that, uh, you're going to pretty much get spread all around the quadratus lumborum muscle. And it probably doesn't matter. I don't think there are too many uh, studies that have compared each of these approaches and found that one is superior to the other. Uh, the outcome of studies have been vastly variable, which means that, you know, there's still a lot of scientific uh, investigation that needs to happen before we can uh, you know find the actual reason why this block works 
So what would you select? If you're doing a lower abdominal surgery, pretty much anything would go. You know that L1 and T12 are very consistently blocked with this block. So you can pretty much give anything. I would probably avoid the intramuscular block, uh, but pretty much any of the three techniques would work. Again, you need to be a bit clever when you're doing uh, the QL for abdominal, upper abdominal surgeries. The gold standards would probably still be the epidural and paravertebral if you can cite them. But if you had to make a choice, it would be either the transmuscular or the QL2. You need to look for a technique that can reliably take the local anesthetic into the paravertebral spaces above. In conclusion, probably I'm, I'm just sticking my neck out here and, and making the statement. It probably, there are multiple modes of action for the quadratus lumborum uh, block. It may work locally on the nerves. It may have a distal spread or you might have systemic action. And uh, who, might, who better than Dr. Sandeep Divan to talk about the ESP, which has largely replaced the quadratus lumborum block in today's practice. Thank you. Thank you, Amjad. Over to you, Vanna, ma'am. I'm unmuting you just a minute. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, ma'am, you're audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Amjit. Thank you so much for that lucid uh, talk on such an elusive block. <clears throat> thank you so much. And I hold, hand over the proceedings to Dr. Murli Thondavavi for, to take their evening forward. Uh, good, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all the uh, viewers. Uh, we are going live on uh, Facebook and also on Anesthesia TV. Uh, so we have a lot of participants from across the world. Now, taking this evening forward, um, we have uh, the- Orly. Yes. Can I, can I interrupt? Can you take the questions? Because there are a lot of questions in the chat box, considering the QL box. No. Uh, should we take the questions now or at the end? No, we can take it now so that it will be relevant to the topic, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, fine. So we have a lot of questions uh, which have come up for Amjit's uh, lecture and I'm sure he did uh, answer a few FAQs at the end. Now to start with, uh, we have uh, Abhijit Nair who is asking a question. He says uh, uh, he's heard Dr. Boglum's lecture and uh, he says he performs the QLB with the sitting position prior to induction in block room. So he wants to know from Dr. Amjit uh, uh, do you do QLB in sitting position or have you done QLB in sitting position? Uh, I have never done it in sitting position. It's quite interesting that uh, he does it in sitting position. I haven't. But then position, again, it's something your, of your ergonomic uh, preference. I'm not sure with, whether gravity would actually influence the flow of the local anesthetic in the sitting position. Uh, but I, again, if Dr. Boglum's doing it and he's getting his local into the paravertebral space, I suppose it doesn't. So there's a lot of fluid dynamics uh, that we need to keep into consideration when we're expecting this flow, this sort of flow towards the against gravity. So I'm, I haven't done it. To answer the question, I haven't done it in my practice. It's, it's always been lateral or supine. I'm, I'm very lazy in positioning patients. So I just like to do the block the way they are. So if they're lying down flat on the bed, I, I just do it and so fine. Okay. Uh, the other question which has come up here is uh, regarding robotic surgeries, uh, laparoscopic robotic surgeries. So uh, can QL blocks be used instead of a four quadrant tap block? Well, yeah, it, it depends. See, uh, it's it's not about the block. It's it's about what you're trying, where you're trying to provide analgesia. there. So you're going to be looking at the incision. You're going to be looking at the amount of surgical dissection for that particular surgery, whether it's a bowel surgery, it's it, uh, you know, a, 
a nephrectomy or it's a prostatectomy. It, it really depends on what you're trying to block. Now, if you're looking predominantly at the incision, you're looking at you know something like an umbilical level incision. Yes, the quadratus lumborum block can provide an energy here there. If it's something like a lower abdominal incision, yes, a big yes for that. The local anesthetic goes on the nerves right there. It's going to provide analgesia. Is it, is the, are you able to technically and reliably push the local anesthetic into the paravertebral space to lay, raise the level? Yep, if you can do that most of the time, why not? Does the local anesthetic go intravascular and cause some sort of a magical systemic analgesia? Yep. It does. So the answer is yes. Uh, you can use it for any of the abdominal surgeries. And of course, if it's a robotic and it's laparoscopic, you'd probably want to do it bilaterally. Okay. Uh, I'm going to combine a few questions here, uh, just going through uh, the questions. Um, one is uh, something which is common. It says, what exactly is the clinical use of knowing so many varieties of QL blocks uh, is, is the party of the question. The part B is what is your choice? Uh, I'm sure you clarified it during the talk, but uh, just as a take home point, can you just uh, elaborate on that? And third thing, as you mentioned, one regarding the systemic absorption. Second, there's a question about myotoxicity as to which of the QL blocks would lead to less myotoxicity. So there are like three questions in one. Okay. Why do we have so many approaches? Uh, you can ask that question for you know pretty much every block that we have in regional anesthesia these days. Uh, small variations of the needle end position are given block a new name for the block, and it leads to confusion. Uh, is it is it relevant that we place the needle one inch away from another position and expect it to do something very different? Common sense will tell you probably not, especially when you're using such large volumes of local anesthetic. Do we need so many approaches? Uh, I know that there are a variety of approaches for the quadratus lumborum block with different names, many of which, which I have not gone through in this particular talk. Uh, I have not used any of those apart from QL1, 2, and 3 in my practice. And based on your technique, you should be able to create all the, the, uh, the, the phenomenal effects of the QL with just these three simple techniques. Do we need all of them? No, we, we certainly don't. We, we want to keep our, local, our regional anesthesia very simple, very attractive. The moment you start complicating it with different names, different techniques, uh, you, know, you pretty much lose half the audience. So let's keep it simple. I think QL one, two, three, uh, is pretty much what we should be looking at. The concepts are very strong uh, on these three approaches. What was the second part, Murli? Myotoxicity. Yeah, so uh, there, was a uh, there was a rebuttal to one of the papers by Murochi who was depositing his local anesthetic bang in the middle of the, quad uh, the quadratus lumborum muscle saying that, we don't, look, we don't know so much, we don't encounter myotoxicity, but we know that Local anesthetics, especially ropivacaine, can create that sort of problem. Uh, pretty much every facial plane block that we do, there are small amounts of local anesthetic that seep into the muzzle, uh, but we shouldn't be aiming to blatantly put it mid-muzzle. We should aim to hit the facial planes or at least the border of it. And uh, pretty much, which is why I didn't give too much importance to the intramuscular uh, sort of uh, injection approach, because I don't think it's a great idea, even if you're using dilute local anesthetics to deposit bang in the middle of the muscle. The third one, Murli? Same thing. I think you covered it with systemic toxicity. Okay. Uh, but many, many comments on the chat box, uh, you know, uh, uh, praising the talk and uh, you know, everybody is like it. I'm just, so, can I intervene? I'm yes, just, uh, uh, there were uh, two, three uh, good questions. Uh, the, there was a question from Dr. Jasbi Chhabra from UK. Uh, do you regularly look for the lumbar artery when you are performing a QL block? And uh, if you have got any video so that it clears the concept. Because okay. that is a, a, a artery, uh, that is a complication we don't want to encounter. 
I would be very disappointed and very worried if I did not see that artery. That is the kind of importance that I place on it in my practice. In fact, I don't go looking for the QL muzzle. I go looking for the artery. And when I, fi when I find that artery, then I look around and say, hey, okay, hey, here's the muzzle. Let me do the block. But let me just stay away from this artery. I personally know of uh, two traumatic uh, experiences that happened where the artery was injured during the block leading to a laparotomy in the post-op period. So you have to look for that artery. I'm sorry I didn't get the image. I will try to look for an image in my other computer showing the artery. Uh, it is easily seen. And if you look at the quadratus lumborum muzzle, it's usually seen around the 11 o'clock position. And if you scan up and down, you'll see it running more and more towards the near axis. So it is imperative that you look for uh, this artery and avoid it. Go close to it. By all means, enter that facial plane. It's a nice place to be, but keep your needle away from that artery. It is downright dangerous. And because it's fairly deep, it's a difficult uh, vessel to control the bleeding with. You're going to have, you're going to struggle to put pressure and stop the bleeding, and it makes a big mess. And uh, uh, there was a question. There was. It's a very good question where to deposit the drug outside the fascia or inside the fascia and where do you in which approach you will prefer putting your catheter if you are using it okay okay so in theory in theory you need to deposit between the layers of the thoracolumbar fascia okay in practice you can't see those layers unless you unless you're unless you have Shiva's machine and you have a pristine uh, patient, which in practice, you don't see these multiple layers. But when you do, when you, if you talk about dual guidance, uh, so another form of dual guidance is to actually feel what the needle is telling you when you're doing ultrasound guided regional anesthesia pops and little, little, little different things. You should be able to discern between fat, muzzle, fascia. So that is one way of approaching it. You know that if you're heading towards something and you feel a pop, you're probably crossed one layer of the fascia. You inject a little bit, see the spread. Okay. Again, this are I, I can say this is the way to be, but in real life, when you have a large obese patient, you're probably thankful you 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 reach a point where you can inject. Uh, the, that's where these kind of blocks seem to be a little bit forgiving. If you make these sort of technical errors in a brachial plexus block, you will you will find that there'll be some sort of sparing. But with, with facial plane blocks, there seems to be some sort of an error margin. So if you're pretty much close to the facial level, you should be able to get some sort of a block going, at least blockade of L1 and T12. But if you want your local anesthetic to start traveling above, so you look for certain signs, you look you try to make use of the plane where the artery is. You look for that, that phenomenon where you inject a little bit of local anesthetic, the area expands and then it collapses. It expands and it collapses. So you know you're in some sort of a plane. If you're inside a muzzle, it goes boom and it stays boom, open like that. But when you see that expansion collapse, expansion collapse, you know you're inside some sort of a facial plane. So this, you use these sort of markers to work your way around and get your block going. As for the catheters, uh, when I started, I think we used to put it more, more or less between the quadratus and the psoas, the, the transmuscular area. You could approach it from the abdomen or you can even you know, sneak it into where the QL2 area is very carefully, of course, because that's a big two he needle that you usually take in very close to that artery. And uh, really knocking an artery with the two e needle is it's never, never a good thing. So either, either place QL2 or the transmuscular areas between would be ideal. Okay, I think we have covered uh, all the questions. Nitesh, uh, Nitesh, one question was that can the QL block, can the QL block be used for allyac crest uh, bone harvesting? We are faced at times with a situation when there's a malunion of the ulna or radius you can do it comfortably and under the one of the upper limb blocks, but the challenge is to take the graft. So can we do it in this? 
Yeah, so uh, you'll have to be a little uh, smart about it. The iliac crest is actually really painful, isn't it? Most of the time, patients will complain of pain at the bone harvest site rather than the actual surgical site. The fascia transfer thallus block addressed this problem, which is a pretty much an interpretation of the QL1. They're pretty much the same, mainly because L1 seems to branch earlier when it is supplying the, the iliac crest. So you want to get these early branches uh, blocked much, uh, much further posterior. Uh, whether you're able to cover the skin on the, that exact spot, whether you got everything again, really it's, it's, it's difficult to blanket it because again, it's, it's a bone, it's osteotome, they're very painful. Uh, unlike soft tissue surgeries like the inguinal hernia, so again, so whether you can do it purely under a quadratus lumborum block, uh, I don't think I have. I've, I've done several surgeries of the inguinal hernia under purely under the block, but not a harvest. But I have used this block regularly to provide analgesia in the iliac crest area. So again, it's anesthesia versus analgesia. Uh, up to you in your practice. Thank you. Over to you, Murli. Yeah, so uh, going ahead, uh, we have the uh, curious and mysterious erectus spinae block. Uh, this is a block that has uh, come into practice uh, from 2016 onwards in both acute and chronic pain. And we have none other than Dr. Sandeep Bhagwan. Uh, we can call him now the Sherlock Holmes of Regional Anesthesia because he's going to be talking about the mysterious pain block. Now, uh, it doesn't require much of introduction, but I'll say a few lines. Uh, he is a senior consultant at the Sanchetti Hospital in Pune, a pioneer in ultrasound uh, regional anesthesia in India uh, for the past couple of decades. Uh, one of the founder members and the pillar of uh, Academy of Regional Anesthesia, and uh, presently uh, work as the academic director and the editor in chief of the International Journal of Regional Anesthesia. Uh, as you all know, he is a faculty at uh, the national meetings and a lot of international meetings as well. Uh, a passionate mentor and teacher in uh, workshops, especially the ones where uh, it involves anatomy and uh, cadaveric workshops. He is the author and the editor in chief of a textbook uh, on regional anesthesia and has contributed many chapters uh, to other anesthesia textbooks. He is also a chronic pain physician, and uh, my association with him is and that friend as well. Uh, not only is a brilliant anesthetist and regional anesthesia enthusiast, but also a fitness enthusiast. And uh, I've learned a lot from him in the last uh, 20 years of association. So I'll hand over the uh, uh, forum to uh, Dr. Sandeep Kuhn to take us through the erector spinal block, and I'm sure he's got a lot of his uh, work with regards to the patient pains and cadavericians. Over to you, Dr. Kuhn. Murli, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. We can hear you. yes, we can hear you. We can see your screen. Please get in. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Morley, for that uh, introduction. And uh, I really love uh, hearing your lectures whenever you do that. Uh, I thank Dr. Amjad for that comprehensive lecture on uh, the uh, uh, Cordatus Lumborum block. And uh, we welcome to this uh, AORA webinar uh, through Sanchiti Hospital, where I've been working for the last uh, five years. And uh, they have given me a real good academic. Uh, 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 academic platform as well. Uh, so uh, we uh, move on to the talk, which is the curious and the mysterious plane, which I've been uh, doing a lot of work on this. Now, this was an attempted thoracic paravertebral block in obese patient, and the catheter was placed uh, with an infusion of 0.2% uh, at 8 ml per hour with a 40% uh, pain relief. Now, once I did that, I was quite surprised that I got the thoracic paravertebral so easily because she was quite obese. As you can see, the uh, distance from the skin uh, through the fat and the muscle plane and then to the costal transverse junction. So I did a contrast study, and to my surprise, I found that the contrast was lying just above the uh, erectus spinae muscle. In the uh, uh, actual view, you can see the 
with the contrast lying as well. So I thought this might be a new block, but then I uh, easily uh, forgot that incidence. And then uh, to my surprise, I uh, found the uh, the article which was by Forero, and uh, he mentioned about uh, uh, five cases, two pa two patients with metastasis to the rib, where he exactly deposited the local anesthetic uh, just below the trapezius and between the rhomboid and the erythrospinae, where I had deposited that local anesthetic, and three patients with VATS. So uh, these uh, these patients, the local anesthetic was deposited just above the uh, the transverse process and below the uh, erythrospinae uh, muscle. So uh, I really missed that bus because I would have been the first to um, uh, notify uh, this particular block. But nevertheless, this is the paravertebral space, which is bounded anterolateral by the pleura, medially by the uh, uh, intervertebral foramen, and uh, posteriorly by the costal transverse ligament. So you, you have to place the local anesthetic for erythrospinae play, um, block uh, deep to the erector uh, uh, spinal uh, muscle. Now, the uh, cadaveric study by uh, by by Fodoro and uh, group uh, they mentioned that the the contrast it lies uh, over the erector spinal muscle. Uh, deep to that, you have the costal transverse foramen, which really do not have any local anesthetic uh, going into it. But they mentioned the dye going into that particular area as well. Uh, the, uh, the 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 contrast studies mention the uh, dye which occupies the uh, the cost of costal transverse foramen, but this is a volume rendering technique, and it really doesn't uh, have the axial, the sagittal, as well as the uh, the the coronal images which will uh, help to identify the exact placement of the contrast in those particular areas. So what is ESP? You need to explore the anatomy. So in 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 in, in Barcelona, where I I collaborated with Xavier Sala Blanche. We dissected uh, in two cadavers the erectospinae plane, and we did injections, but this were in the cervical and the lumbar area because thoracic area was explored uh, a lot by then. Now this is the dorsum of the of the, the fresh frozen cadaver. This is the spinous process, and this is the transverse process. The protuberance, what you see, is the transverse process. Now. In between the transverse process connected to each other is the inter is the uh, intertransverse ligament, and that's a very important barrier because that's a thick barrier which goes to a certain depth here. And uh, if you see the transverse process, medial will lie the medial erythrospinal plane. We have removed the uh, the spinalist uh, the th thoracic muscle from the medial aspect, and you will see the bare area which lies here. And we also have reflected laterally the. Uh, uh, the, the, the longissimus coli, the iliopostalis will lie more laterally. So we have got three erectospinal muscles over here. So it, the, the thing is that you have a deep erectospinal plane, which is lateral to the, the, the transverse process, and you have a medial erectospinal plane, which is called also the retrolaminar plane. Now, if you see the floor of this uh, particular plane, you will see that it's all knitted, it's all interwoven, and do you really find any gap which will allow the local anesthetic from, to pass from this plane uh, uh, ventrally or anteriorly? So that's the that's the problem here. And several cadaveric studies will give you some very uh, confusing and uh, very uh, questionable uh, uh, solutions to that. So now in the literature, if you dissect the pool study, which was done by Ban uh, by uh, Ban Shui, he mentions that for all, when he uh, first described this in 2016, there was a surge in the publications and most of them were a single shot and in the, at the level of thoracic and there were rarely a cervical or uh, a lumbar and uh, continuous techniques. And 90.5% of the time, they were case reports and series, 5.5%. 5.5% were cadaver studies, 2.4% uh, were randomized control trials, and most of the publications, they came from uh, Turkey. And they mentioned that it's a successful paravertebral surrogate with simple, superficial, safe, and is devoid of any complications. Now, if you consider a pool uh, review of 242 patients, the limitations of these are the reporting bias, low-grade evidence, lack of clinical trials, and there is no quantitative evidence of the ESP efficacy. And so we are back to square one. Now we need to analyze, considering the, uh, the, the, the cadaveric, the clinical, as well as the contrast studies, and then come to some conclusion. So do we have the answers in the thoracic area? Is the ESP a paravertebral uh, surrogate? That is what we uh, need to find out. And we do this by dissecting through the cadavers, clinical, and contrast studies. 
So analyzing the cadaveric studies, I take a few of uh, the studies where uh, 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 this group, they mentioned that if you inject 20 ml at the level of T5, uh, there is a cephalocaudent and a lateral spread. Dorsal rema is stained. This is the dorsal rema which gets stained. And uh, the, the, the drug runs from cephala uh, to cordon along the erectospinae, but the ventral ramus is not stained at all. So this is what the group mentions. In another 20 cadavers, uh, comparing the retrolaminal with ESP with 20 ml, you could see the dye spread uh, on the back of the muscles. But at this point, you could see the spread which was on the ventral aspect and, and stains the uh, intercostal nerve as well. But this is just one single intercostal nerve. And this we find it quite usual because we have done a few cadaveric studies which are unreported and we saw that the there is a single or maybe uh, two levels where the, uh, the intercostal nerves are stent. So is it important? That's the question. My friends, uh, Luke and uh, Xavier Sala, they conducted a study again, and uh, they, they found that there is no contrast which spreads beyond the transverse process or beyond the costal transverse junction, and everything is behind the costal transverse junction. There is no ventral spread. There is no paravertebral spread. And the ventral ramai here, you will see that they are not stained at all in any of these uh, cadavers. So we have, uh, we have, a, we have something from the cadaveric studies uh, with opposing um, uh, with opposing mechanisms. Again, there was an unpredictable injected spread of erythrospinic plane block in human cadavers. They don't have any. Uh, they, they 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 did study eleven fresh frozen cadavers, but they don't have any figures. What they have is this graph particular where they have, they have these cadavers and they show that there is an unpredictable spread, uh, erratic spread in uh, among all these uh, fresh frozen cadavers. But one thing they acknowledge that the changes in the intrathoracic pressures, which might lead to anterior spread of the solution. And this might be true because with, uh, with the phases of respiration, we saw we see the spread and we see the delineation. When you, when you mark at zero hours and you mark at maybe eight hours and then at 24 hours, with a continuous infusion, the, the spread, it, it keeps on increasing and the sensory delineation, it keeps on increasing. So that is one mechanism of spread. And the other would be the tensile strength in the, of the tissues in the cadavers will be different from the, uh, from the live uh, humans. Coming to analysis of clinical studies in the thoracic era, in the rib fractures, uh, some of these groups through case studies and case phase studies have mentioned its use and it, it is being now routinely used for the multiple refractors. And this retrospective cohort by uh, this group, they mentioned that the pulmonary function increases in 24 hours and the NRS is decreased by 39% for the first three hours. So if you take just 40% decrease and just for uh, just for first three hours as a successful block, I'm not sure whether you really you can, you can, you can mention it as an established block for multiple refractors. But they acknowledge that there is a possible benefit in anticoagulated patients. Now, my uh, my uh, colleague uh, Abhijit Nair has cautioned the use of erythrospinal plain block in patients with uh, abnormal coagulation or coagulopathy. But at the same time, uh, there is a reporter from uh, another author who mentions that it can be really used because the erythrospinal plain block, uh, the muscles can be compressed in an unlikely event of uh, hematoma formation. So. Abhijit is there on the, on, the, on the forum, so we can have some answers from him. Uh, coming to thoracotomy, there's a weak evidence uh, regarding the use in thoracotomy. They have used in lung transplant and in uh, thoracotomy patients. Uh, the problem with this was found by uh, this author who mentions that there is uh, no sensory delineation in the anterior part of the thorax uh, in the parasternal area with erectospinal plane block. And this might be true because we did find the, the problems with, of uh, using erectospinal plane block in uh, sternal fractures. Nevertheless, there, there are incidences or there are reports of uh, ESP being used in cardiac surgeries. Uh, this randomized controlled trial, are a, a prospective study in 60 patients compared with fentanyl infusions, and they found that the opioid was and adverse effects were less. And definitely in ESP group, you'll find the, uh, the WAS scores uh, were, uh, were less uh, uh, with the uh, low uh, requirements of uh, fentanyl, as well as the adverse effects were less in this uh, particular uh, group of patients. So ESP definitely help in comparison with intravenous fentanyl, but they all acknowledge that there is no comparison with the gold standard thoracic epidural or a paravertebral block. 
Uh, coming to breast surgery, which has uh, a lot of uh, articles uh, which have been mentioned where ESP can be used. Uh, they had uh, a, a single case report in a high risk case uh, when this was given at the level of T5, 20 ml, and they mentioned its use as an opioid spreading and immunomodulator. At the level of T4 with 20 ml, they found that the 65% morphine spreading in a randomized controlled trial. But again, they have a problem that it does not block the anterior cutaneous nerve, which supplies in the parasternal area and the supraclavicular nerves. And definitely in this article, they mentioned the limitations where they have two failures of ASP and they use transverse thoracic plane block as a rescue. And remember, they use the thoracic paravertebral block as a rescue analgesic for the uh, uh, ESP block. So the breast is supplied by a lot of these nerves, which you can see uh, from the lateral aspect, all these nerves which supply the breast and the, the medial aspect, which is again supplied by the, uh, the, the lateral divisions of the anterior cutaneous nerves. Uh, a, a lot of blocks have been mentioned, the pec sap and the, uh, uh, the pectoral interfacial plane block, the anterior cutaneous nerve block, as well as the ESP. Uh, but ESP, whatever they have been mentioned, they, they are all uh, not randomized trials and there's a controversial spread as we have seen earlier. So the question that haunts me is, whether the ESP blocks the, 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 uh, the, the pectoral nerves, whether it blocks the anterior cutaneous nerves, it can be used in which breast surgeries and at what levels it would be useful at the T2, T3, or T4. That's the problem. So we acknowledge, they acknowledge that the SAP and the PEX is better than ESP in, for, for the breast, uh, breast surgeries. Uh, coming to abdominal surgeries, uh, I'm concerned about the visceral pain, uh, pain relief. Though a case series have been reported in all these cases at all these levels from T6 to T12. And there are randomized controlled trials where they mention again low VAS scores for the first three years with low opioid consumption. I'm not sure whether you can take the first three, just the first three years as a successful block. And again, in another randomized controlled trial for abdominal hysterectomy, they mentioned the total fentanyl consumption has gone down. Uh, with 14% uh, in the perioperative period and 37% in the post-operative period with VAS of uh, decrease in the first 12 hours. So this is a good study that we can really look into. So this they gave at the level of T7, and this was done at the level of uh, T5 and T6. Now, does it produce visible analgesia? Now, uh, this was a study which mentioned about uh, what I was mentioning was about this study, 14% decrease in the intraoperative and 37 decrease in the post-operative for the first six hours. And this is supported by uh, two cadaver studies by Forero and Young and two clinical studies by Kijin who used it in bariatric surgery and uh, this person who used it in another patient for laparoscopic surgeries. So the question that still haunts us is whether ESP definitely produces visible analysis. Some answers have been given by this particular uh, article. Uh, coming to spine, the lumbosacral spine surgeries, uh, this is a, a case series where they uh, did six cases and they gave bilateral uh, um, blocks. Uh, there was no effect on somatosensory potentials and they had opioid spreading and enhanced recovery. And this comes from uh, India as well. And they mentioned low VAS scores. And there are several articles which I have also uh, gone through where, uh, which might be published in future about the use of uh, uh, these blocks for the uh, spine surgeries as, as well. Uh, coming to, we have seen the cadaveric as well as the clinical trials. We come to the contrast studies and they mention uh, this uh, group, they mention the use of 30 ml contrast spread, uh, which is deep to the erectospinal muscles and it goes into the intervertebral foramen at all these levels. It goes around the epidural space, the anterior lateral and the posterior epidural space. So this is a contrast study where they did an MRI uh, imaging uh, study uh, and they found that the contrast does go into the uh, into these particular spaces. Uh, sometimes back myself and Abhijit, we mentioned about the spread uh, of the contrast, which uh, spreads from the erectospinal plane through two parts. One is through the uh, through the dorsal ramp path, and the second is through the costal transverse foramen, and it goes into the uh, into the foramen and then into the epidural space posterior, and then goes on to the other side. Now remember that this is the injection just on one side, and this is just 10 ml. And you give bilateral injections, it's going to cause a hemodynamic compromise in maybe a critical ill patients, and that's why you need to be uh, very very um, cautious after you give the first block. You monitor for 10 minutes, and then maybe you can give the the block on the other side. 
Uh, coming to analysis of local anesthetic volumes, this particular author, he, he studied um, uh, uh, several of these um, uh, uh, case studies where they use 20 to 30 ml at different sites and they found the spread from T1 to T12 and sometimes to L4. And the volumes that uh, he mentioned is a mean of 3.4 ml uh, per dermatome. So this is might be a reference value for your future studies when you start using it for the, uh, uh, for the thoracic procedures. Uh, the last would be the analysis of literature evidence. Now, this is a randomized controlled trial, which uh, they have used these uh, authors who come from all from most of them are from Turkey and there's two from uh, India as well. And when they use this forest plot, they found that it favors most um, in the is in a favor of ESP when they use it versus the controls. And they also found a reduction in the opioid for the first 24 hours with a prolonged time to first analysis and, and the reduction in uh, rescue analysis as well. Now, what contribution uh, we have done in, you know, uh, in, in erythrospinate plain block through our studies? So uh, we did the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar uh, studies, as I have mentioned it uh, earlier. Um, the lumbar is one which we are still uh, writing upon, and this is the the, the, the cervical cross sections where I injected dye at the level of C uh, at the level of T1, and we found that in the contrast it goes between the medial and the lateral lateral erectospine along the course of the dorsal rami, and it goes right up to the dorsal of the ventral root. It really doesn't enter into the foramen and doesn't go into the epidural space. But the same thing when we injected this the, this is the same uh, cadaver um, uh, where we had injected the contrast. And we found that the dye had gone right up to the anterior skeleton muscle. We had dissected four of them, and uh, we had injected in four of them. And just one uh, on the on the right side, on the on the right side, it showed the dye on the anterior skeleton muscle. And it also was uh, in between the fat plane of the sternocleidomastoid and the anterior skeleton muscle. That means that in this particular, it did block the phrenic nerve as well as the supraclavicular nerve. But Overall, uh, we had a 75% uh, phrenic spreading, uh, if you consider the, uh, the cadaver studies. Uh, this is a thoracic cadaver. You are seeing the sagittal section. This was described the last time. If you look from the, from the back, this is the skin and the subcute. This is the erectospinal muscle. And this is the, the, the transverse processes. Joining the two is the uh, intertransverse ligament. Joining the rib and the transverse process is the posterior transverse ligament. So the needle, if it is if it is if it is deep to the erectospinae and superficial to the ITL, is the deep erectospinae plane block. But if it goes beyond this barrier, then it is in the uh, the costal transfer space, which has been described. I mean, if it goes beyond the super, superior costal transfer ligament, it is in the paravertebral space. This is the ventral nerve root. That's the dorsal nerve root. So anything we we inject be, be behind the superior costal transfer ligament will be a dorsal nerve block unless the local anesthetic it seeps through the costal transverse ligament and blocks the, the, the ventral nerve root. So that is the inference that we get from this uh, anatomical description. Uh, some of the clinical studies in, uh, in our hospital include the uh, cervical ESP for the shoulder surgeries. As I described earlier, we did five cases and we found that the contrast, it goes to the dorsal of the uh, ventral rami, not into the neuroaxial space and uh, some of it goes into the paravertebral space and it blocks the, uh, the, uh, the, the dorsal as well as the ventral root. There's no dye over the uh, phrenic, um, uh, over the anterior skeleton muscle close to the phrenic nerve, so we, we, we mention as a phrenic spreading. And we are now conducting a, a pilot study of uh, a certain group of patients. Uh, the use of perioperative uh, management for cervical spine surgery. Uh, we described this uh, uh, when the patient is in a prone position, we insert catheters bilaterally in the, at the level of T1 with the catheter going uh, cephalide. And then we inject local anesthetic. We find that uh, from C2 to T1, you have good uh, amount of uh, uh, relief of pain over a period of 48 hours. We connect this to the infusion pumps at 0.1% ropivacin at around five to six ml per hour. Postoperatively, before removing the catheters, we do contrast studies. We see the contrast going in the paravertebral space and nothing going along the ventral route and nothing going into the neuroaxial space in the axial as well as in the coronal sections. So it means that this can be a motor sparing as well as a, a phrenic sparing block. Uh, this is the uh, uh, immediate... 
immediately after the uh, operation, the, there is a, a rapid recovery, and you will see that the uh, patient has got a normal uh, neurological uh, function. So this is what we have been using for the posterior cervical instrumentation and decompression. Uh, coming to thoracic, we described in scoliosis, uh, um, where we injected uh, on the uh, concave as well as on the convex sides. We found that the concave requires a more volume of local anesthetic uh, than the convex side, and you require multiple injections on the concave and maybe single or just two injections on the uh, on the convex side. And we found that it has got um, uh, again uh, opioid sparing um, uh, opioid sparing uh, activity as well as the the requirements of uh, total intravenous anesthesia that is propofol, dexmate, and fentanyl consumptions are really less than when you don't use. Uh, uh, erectospinal plain block for scoliosis surgery. Again, to keep in mind, we also reported that it, does, it doesn't have any effect on somatosensory evoke potentials, which we monitored every time when we uh, did an uh, erectospinal plain block for uh, scoliosis surgery. Uh, for polytrauma uh, of, of the uh, spine, yes, um, uh, we, we use uh, for, uh, we reported this in, in patient with multiple refractors. And in the same patient uh, fractures of the transverse process and the sacroiliac joint. And we found that this contrast, it goes into the paravertebral space here in the, uh, in the sagittal as well as in the axial planes. And this would be a definite contraindication because this patient had some amount of spinal cord injury, would be a contraindication for the uh, uh, thoracic epidural. So, and this would have never reached the, uh, the, the lower levels where you can see the contrast right from T7 down to the level of L4. So this one is really helpful in patients with, with, with polytrauma and spinal cord injury as well. Uh, in, in, in the lumbar ASP, we reported that when you inject uh, a volumes of around 40 ml or uh, 40 ml of local anesthetic behind the transverse process in the actual oblique plane, we, we found that the contrast goes into the, 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 into the foramen and it blocks at multiple levels, the ventral load, and that's why uh, it obtained the knee and ankle reflexes. So this cannot be an ambulatory block. You need to be careful. So we always monitor whether the patient has got foot drop or quadriceps weakness after a lumbar erectospinal plane block. So we find that it's a volume dependent spread because this is not uh, reported, uh, but we would do that soon. Uh, this is a 10 ml injection. That's the 20 ml. That's 30 ml and 40 ml local anesthetic. So as you keep on inject, injecting the volumes, it keeps on spreading into the psoas major and it blocks the uh, lumbar plexus as well. This is called as the coronal axial plane, where you can see multiple spinous processes and multiple transverse and uh, processes as well as uh, vertebral uh, bodies. Now coming to the last part is the sacral ESP. Now myself and Arunan Shu are, are, are working on this as well as Abhijit, we are working on this acute and chronic sacroiliac joint pain. And uh, what we found was very interesting in this. Now, this is the, uh, this is the, uh, this is the foramen that you see is the gap on the sacral plate. This is the uh, sacral foramen second. Uh, this is the uh, sacral foramen third. That's the portal epidural space and is the sacral multipedus. So what we do is we insert the needle at this particular point, just under the sacral multipedus and we inject around 20 ml of local anesthetic. And you can see the spread. It obtains all the uh, dorsal foramina here. You can see that, and it spreads right up to the level of, uh, uh, level of T12. And that's a, a huge amount of spread uh, that, we, that, we, that we find. And this has also been reported by uh, Tulgar from uh, Turkey. But more interesting was, uh, since we found that uh, the patient had numbness in the foot as well, uh, we took her to uh, took her to the uh, to, to the imaging uh, under CT scan. We found the contrast spread, which was from the dorsal rama here into the uh, foramen and then into the uh, ventral uh, foramen and then going into the epidural sp space and along the sacral plexus. So that was the spread, and this spread also was uh, medially along the uh, caudal epidural. So. You cannot really compare a sacral with the lumbar, with the thoracic and the cervical because these are all different kinds of plane with different kinds of muscles and uh, different kinds of apertures and uh, the holes that you, that the foramina that you can see like this. So this is what we now use in sacroiliac joint pain for post-traumatic and metastasis with a single shot catheter and we're trying to uh, report this uh, in, in, into one of the uh, journals as well. 
So the current application for thoracolumbar, we use it for spine surgery. That is the placement of the catheter. And this is a radiopaque catheter that we place. And you can just take an image. You don't have to inject contrast because you know uh, the, the spread of the contrast. And this we use for uh, multi-segment lumbosacral spine surgeries. The next one is a patient uh, who was anticoagulated and had a dual uh, erectospinal plane block. You can see two infusions. He had, um, he had, he had a cervical trauma as well. Uh, which was uh, non -op -op which was not operated upon, but he had a proximal humerus and a proximal femur for, for which uh, he had two infusions, one going into the cervical and one going into the uh, lumbar area. Uh, the cervical area, uh, this is the upside down, that's the, that's the dorsal part, that's the ventral part. You can see from the dorsum, uh, the, it coming along the, the path of the dorsal rami, this is the medial erector, that's the lateral erector, and it goes right up to the dorsal rami, and it will stain just the ventral, uh, dorsal part of the ventral uh, area. Uh, this is the catheter coming into the uh, cancerous process, and if you inject local anesthetic, again, there will be spread in the erectospinae. A partial spread in the lumbar plexus can be also visible at times if you increase the volumes. So the ASP will reach where uh, the, the thoracic epidural and paravertebral blocks can be uh, contraindicated or cannot be given. For example, this is a complex scapular surgery that we do. Um, and uh, you cannot really give a paravertebral block or you cannot, keep a, uh, you cannot do a thoracic epidural in this case. Uh, this patient also had an eyelid crest and you could see the, the sensory delination. And somebody was saying about the role of the uh, uh, role of the interfacial plane blocks for uh, the uh, iliac crest. Now, this is the area which is supplied by the, the cluneal nerves. Now, this cluneal nerve it arises from the level of the lumbar, the dorsal, and then it goes along this. So, the erectospinal plane will definitely help in uh, blocking the, uh, the the cutaneous area as well. But we are not sure about the uh, uh, the osteo uh, osteotome or the bone. So the advantage is it facilitates opioid sparing. There will be early extubation, and you've already seen effective physiotherapy in the post-operative period and mobilization following surgery, as we have seen in all these patients. Complications, pneumothorax has been reported in one of the patients. You need to be very careful when you do this in scoliosis because the pleura will be very, very close and the muscles are thinned out. The erectospinal muscles are thinned out on the convex side and you need to be very careful in that. Unexpected motor weakness, it was reported earlier, and we also um, endorse this particular thing, and it can be a non-ambulatory um, uh, block. You, you have to be very careful. You have to monitor the quadriceps <coughs> weakness as well as uh, foot drop. Uh, some of the points to remember that whenever you do a, a interfacial plane block, you need to evaluate the invasiveness of the surgery. If it's a soft tissue surgery or it's involving the bone, it's involving the, uh, the dermatome on the other side, if it's crossing the midline, investigate the anatomic area of tissue dissection, assess the dermatomes, myotomes, and sclerotomes uh, of uh, each uh, surgical site. Block sel uh, selection is based on clinical evidence. Now you have a lot of evidences for erectospinal plane block or any other interfacial plane block. Go through that. And then you can really uh, come into conclusion which block to be used for which surgical procedures. You need to understand the ongoing breach or gap in the knowledge. This is very important, and you have to have additional research uh, in process. Or, uh, what, uh, and you need to be updated all the time about the interfacial plane blocks. And then you make an assessment and then conclude that this interfacial plane block would be best suited for this type of uh, uh, surgery. For example, if you take breast, we know that the PEX and SAP would be more better than uh, ESP block. Of course, there is no a uh, randomized controlled trial between these two blocks. So in my opinion, <clears throat> if you can consider this as a cross-section, uh, the, uh, uh, the ESP is a dorsal rami block, which is used for all dorsal surgeries. For, uh, there's a, since there's an inconsistent ventral spread, it can be rarely used for uh, ventral surgeries, but there are reports that it is now being used for ventral surgeries as well. And this could be because of blockage of lateral cutaneous nerves as well as some of the anterior cutaneous nerves. Now, if you consider some of the recent changes in uh, the uh, nomenclature of the anatomy or the dissections of the anatomy, they have found that there is a differing type of uh, innervation of all these muscle groups. And that's a total, total different topic. And this might be the, one of the reasons why the erectospinal plane block might act through the, uh, through the dorsal ramai. 
Uh, it's a high volume block and uh, the plasma local anesthetic levels have not been monitored as of yet. I'm not uh, really um, aware of this thing and this has to be done because we, we do inject uh, 20 to 25 ml bilateral and then we keep them on infusions for uh, almost 24 to uh, 48 hours. So these things have to be monitored as well. Uh, some of the RCTs are required in future considering this block with the uh, gold standard and there are, I think, in clinical trials, I've seen a lot of these blocks now are being compared. Soon we'll be able to uh, have a, a definite uh, answer to all these uh, questions. Some of the gray areas to be answered are, uh, are all the, uh, the uh, ESP uh, same like the cervical, thoracic, lumbar and sacral? I have demonstrated through cadaver and the contrast studies that they are not the same and they can be different. Uh, would it be simply uh, would it be possible to sim simplify the nomenclature? Uh, we have uh, recently um, uploaded an article regarding this, and uh, maybe soon it would happen. And this we had uh, discussed the last time. The volumes in cervical and lumbar erythrospinae have not been yet clarified. The thoracic, to some extent, yes. Is it a volume dependent block? Uh, yes, I demonstrated through the, uh, uh, through the contrast that in the lumbar area, definitely it is. Whether you require catheters or no catheters, we have, they have not yet studied. Ambulation or no ambulation, yes, you have to be very careful when you, have, when you need an ambulation, particularly for the uh, lumbar erectospinae. We are not, um, uh, it's not a problem with the thoracic. Uh, with cervical, uh, yes, we do ambulate the patients uh, with the cervical uh, catheters as well. Uh, sacral ESP, does it work? I think it works and it might change the future. Uh, myself, uh, Abhijit and Arunamshu, we are working on that right now. And we see that it might be used in certain kind of surgeries that has not been described in the literature as well. And the last thing is, does ESP fail and how do you rescue it? At least there is one uh, article which mentions that the thoracic paravertebral block, in fact, has been used as a rescue analysis for ESP block. ESP block, yes, it does fail if your catheter is not in the right place. I've got certain contrast studies which I've not included in this talk, but yes, I had failures with the uh, ESP as well. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, thank you, uh, organizers of AORA, Ritesh. Um, Murli, as well as uh, Dr. Vandana. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sandeep. It was a comprehensive work of ordering on a masterclass on the SP blog. We have a few questions uh, from the uh, viewers here. The first one is regarding uh, the use of uh, ultrasound and uh, people without ultrasound, what is the strategy? Yeah, so uh, Murli, I think uh, you and me were performing thoracic paravertebral blocks with loss of resistance technique, where you used to hit the costal transverse junction and just go beyond that and inject your local anesthetic. Now, the, the difference is of just one centimeter. If you come just one centimeter behind the, um, uh, the, the paravertebral space, just you hit the costal transverse junction and you give the local anesthetic. So that becomes your erectospinal plane block. The only thing is that you're not uh, visualizing the spread of the local anesthetic agent, but I think it should be as good as what uh, it spreads under ultrasound as well. Okay, that's the first one. Uh, the second question was uh, regarding the uh, uh, cervical ESP, which you already answered uh, quite comprehensively. The third question was, can these blocks be used as sole anesthetic? Uh, sole anesthetic, uh, no, it cannot be used. It's uh, basically a dorsal RMI block. Um, uh, we have tried in a few patients uh, in whom a soft tissue surgery like maybe a lipoma excision or uh, maybe a, a hemangioma excision uh, on the dorsal aspect. Uh, but then um, we really could not block all the dermatomes in this. So uh, I think it cannot be still used as a uh, a sole block. Of course, there was a, a study we've done by Tulgar, which has been included in the Indian Journal of Anesthesia. I'm quite surprised how the reviewers could uh, say yes to that article. He used erectospinal plane block and a uh, cordatus lumorum block for hip surgery. And he used the, uh, the amount of propofol that he used was equal to the anesthetic um, uh, as, an, as an anesthetic agent. So I really am I'm surprised by this particular uh, article. Uh, the next question uh, is, I think somebody needs to, okay, the next question is regarding the difference between a, a, a thoracic paravertebral and ESP, uh, which already you have answered, uh, and which one is better for post-mastectomy pain. 
uh, any any comments on that? Just a one line, which you already have uh, covered in the uh, yeah thoracic paravertebral. Yes, uh, Moli, I have used it in the past for uh, sole surgical procedures. I demonstrated that in couple of uh, uh, a couple of workshops in the past. It does block the motor sensory and the sympathetic nerves. I'm not sure why the paravertebral block is not getting obsolete, but there are uh, there is a certain group which really mentions that um, uh, that uh, its uh, erector spinae is a rib uh, two block. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about uh, why this was uh, mentioned, but definitely uh, paravertebral block has got its own place, and the erector spinae plane block has its own place. Your experience uh, of uh, ESP for PCN. Uh, no experience. I, I'm just an orthopedic. Okay. Now, with regards to ESP, uh, again, you have already covered this, but the question was from Dr. Slokija. Why is ESP uh, block not so well defined in the lumbar region as compared to thoracic? And is it due to the decrease in bulkiness of the muscle in the lumbar region? Uh, the ESP is not described, she says, in the lumbar area. So uh, if you can go through the article by Xavier Salah-Blanche in uh, Radar, the Radar is a spinal journal of anesthesiology, and he mentions at the level of L4, where he injected uh, methylene blue dye in uh, six cadavers and 12, uh, and 12 specimens, and he found that uh, less than 50% of the times, the methylene blue dye, it uh, trespasses and, uh, and goes into the lumbar plexus. Uh, this is one thing that I found, and uh, my study with contrast, which will be will be soon published. Also, we also have seen that if you keep on increasing the volume from 10 to 40, the uh, there will be a translocation or migration of local anesthetic from the dorsal to the ventral. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, the situation of the muscle groups in the lumbar, thoracic, and the cervical are different. Three in lumbar, three in thoracic, and then it becomes six in uh, six in the uh, cervical area, and it becomes just one in the sacral area. So each has got different uh, mechanism of spread and dynamics. Sure. Uh, and another, I think this will be probably the last question uh, regarding acute pain management in spine fractures. Yeah. So uh, acute pain management, I described, I think. Uh, uh, and you, did, are, you did. You did. You did. Yes. And there are certain articles which mention the burst fractures, then the L4, uh, the the transverse process fractures. All these are being managed by uh, erectospinal plane block. And this is one area which we are where you can use catheter and you can decrease the amount of pain. Yes, it can be used. Okay. And uh, also I think yeah. for the, um, uh, what they call it as, uh, what do you do? The You put cement into the vertebral plastics. Yes. Okay. So I think uh, with regards to the questions, we have more or less covered. Uh, Murli, uh, can you, uh, Murli, I'm Dr. Vrushali here. Uh, I just have one or two questions for Sandeep, if, with your permission. Yes, please. please. Uh, as uh, Sandeep, brilliant. Uh, I enjoyed your presentation. I want to revisit two slides of yours, if you don't mind. Can you please, uh, because I have certain um, queries on it. I, I want to see the, uh, the slide when in which you elaborately showed the cervical trans sec uh, transverse section and showed the catheter. The one in which it, it felt like it was going in. Yeah. This one? No, yes. no the lower one. Okay. No, the, uh, it, no, lower down, lower down. This one? The, the catheter, the catheter no, no. in the cervical spine, uh, in the transverse section of the neck. Lower down, I think uh, there was one in which... Uh, I'm not sure which one, this one. This, this one, this one, uh, that one, yeah. That's yeah, lumbar. yeah, this, this, that's lumbar. So that's not the catheter, Rosali. that's the contrast which is going into the, uh, uh, which is going into the, uh, into the, uh, uh, in between the medial and the and the lateral erector spine. All right. Okay. Hmm. And can uh, one one more can can we go to the cadaveric study of yours in the neck, where you have shown the contrast going right up till the anterior aspect of the neck. Yeah. So uh, uh, because Rosalind I have pondered on that transverse section for quite some time. Yeah. So uh, this. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this was exactly given at the level of uh, T1 with the bevel okay. directed cephalad. 
and the injectate was in the cephalate direction and the cross sections were taken at, uh, taken at mandible which is at the level of uh, C2 at the hyoid which is not shown here at the level of C4 and the cricoid which was at the level of C6 and uh, in all the sections we found that the contrast spread from the dorsal uh, in between the lateral and the medial erectospinal group and it goes right up to the transverse process here and then it spills off uh, somewhere here at this point where it dorsal to the ventral root. It doesn't go in and, and block the, uh, soak the ventral and it doesn't go into the neural axis. And it doesn't go over the, uh, over the long, over the scaling group of muscles. So it doesn't block the phrenic. But when we did this uh, injections and uh, we did the cadaver study first, and then we freeze the cadavers and then we took cross sections. So when you inject contrast and we took the uh, CT image uh, the next day, we found the contrast going in one specimen on the anteroskeletal muscle. And in the same, we found it going between the uh, fat planes of sternocleidomastoid and the anteroskeletal muscle. This is where exactly the supraclavicular nerves, they lie. So this demonstrate that this could cause a phrenic nerve a block as well as a supraclavicular nerve block. But that was in just one specimen out of four. So that means 75%. It doesn't cause a phrenic nerve block. Uh, if, if it was, no, this is just for my clarity and understanding. Uh, if the transverse process and, and the erector spinae, and if the space in between the two is your erector spinae block, then our contrast should be even there as well, or the dye should be there as well. So uh, that's why, it, that, yeah, that's why I call it as a mysterious plane. Now, what you say, I correct the. You mean the contrast should be somewhere at this point, isn't it? And the contrast never. Posterior never, to that, I guess. Yes, posterior to that. Isn't it even posterior yes. to that? Yes. yes, exactly. So what the uh, what the other group has done and recently presented a cadaver study in cervical, they injected this at a level of C6 and they injected a huge volume of around 20 ml and then they found that it goes into the brachial plexus and blocks it. I mean, it soaks those nerves. That is imaginable, yes. Yes, uh, yes. But then, but we, then we does have, you have done it under ultrasound, right? Yeah, ultrasound, but at the level of T1. Remember, the shoulder surgeries, uh, all the proximal humor surgeries, they require from the level of T1 to C6. Mm, maybe it was likely lateral and uh, an injection perhaps might give this. Would you agree? Uh, I'm not sure because okay. there is a change in the muscle group and the facial planes when you go from the thoracic to the cervical area. The, the whole thing changes. So definitely yeah. something that we, we commonly see when we inject in the Yeah, okay. Okay. And I think I have a last question which has just come up now. Uh, the difference between uh, intermittent bolus and infusion uh, in ESP catheters. Yeah, we do intermittent boluses. We do it. So that's on patient demand. That just when the patient starts having uh, uh, small uh, uh, changes in the vas course, we, we tell him that it's time for his injection. So the nurse actually gives that. We have, we have trained the nurses to give that. So we don't have to be there all the time. Okay. Uh, Dr. Narasandeep, it has been an excellent session. Uh, Dr. Amjad as well, I need to say very comprehensive lectures. Uh, and uh, we have covered most of the questions that the audience has uh, come up with. Uh, I hand over the uh, mic to Dr. Ritesh to uh, take it over. Uh, 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 thank you, uh, Dr. Amjad, Dr. Sandeep, sir, uh, for an excellent presentation. Uh, thank you, Murli, sir, and Vanda, madam for moderating this session very nicely. Uh, thank you, Sonosite, for providing us our, their Zoom platform. Thank you, special thanks to Savita from Sonosite. Thank you, Anastasia TV, for the live streaming on their platform. And most importantly, thank you, all the delegates. Without you, this webinar would not have been success. I request all of you, you can download your certificates uh, of uh, uh, this webinar after a few days on uh, uh, by logging in onto the Aura uh, uh, or Aura uh, YouTube uh, Aura um, account, and uh, you can download your certificates. And uh, uh, this webinar series will continue. 
see you all on next uh, uh, second Saturday of next month. Uh, till that time, be all safe. Take care of of yourself and be safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Ma'am. You want to add something? Thank you, Ritesh. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank Take you, care. everybody. Thank you, Ritesh. Amjad. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks you, Ritesh.